Hi, welcome to More Christ. Uh, today I'm joined by the brilliant Nicholas Andrew Basbeans. Nick is an author who writes and lectures widely about authors, books, and book culture. His subjects have included the, the eternal passion for books in A Gentle Madness, the history and future of libraries, patience and fortitude, the willful destruction of books and the determined effort to rescue them, a splendor of letters, the power of the printed word to stir the world, every book its reader, the invention of paper and its effect on civilization mm. on paper, the, the everything of its 2000 year history and an exploration of the wonderful poet, Longfellow's life and art, Cross of Snow, a life of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. So just to begin then, Nick, um, can you tell us a little bit, please, about your background and some of the key currents in your life that have helped to form your character? Thank you. And I think I think just by citing a number of my books, you can see a pattern there that book history, book culture has if there's a theme that runs through all of them, it's really this, this passion for books, not only for what they contain, but also for what they are, these artifacts, these vehicles of, of wisdom, of culture, of literature. Uh, and uh, that, that's been a lifelong passion of mine. And I've had a couple of professional lives as a journalist, as a literary editor, as a columnist, as an interviewer of authors, many hundreds of them in a prior life, you know, I became kind of a, a late bloomer in that my first book was published almost 26 years ago when I was 52. You know, I was, uh, Shakespeare had already died when he was 52 and here <laughs> I was publishing my first book and and now Cross of Snow is my 10th. But, you know, General Madness was uh, it was a study, uh, a cultural study of the, of the passion, uh, like I called it, I, I, the gentle madness of bibliomania, to possess books but with a much higher, deeper purpose of not only have you had these people through history who have wanted to gather and, 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 and possess these, these artifacts, but in the process, preserve culture. I mean, collectors tend to do that. They save things that other people see as trash as, and, and so many wonderful uh, uh, materials through history uh, all over the world, you know, wouldn't exist, would be lost forever if it weren't for collectors. And so that was the first book. And it, it had a nice resonance, it, uh, it appealed, and I decided to do what would be a companion study, which was Patience and Fortitude. And I should point out that the title of that book, uh, for those in the UK and Ireland, uh, where you have a, a great deal of uh, exposure, thank you, really delighted to be reaching this audience uh, over there. But Patience and Fortitude is, are kind of the informal names of the lions that stand guard in front of the New York Public Library in New York and how they got their name goes back to the to the Great Depression when Fiorello LaGuardia, the, the mayor of New York City would give these uh, radio talks and he would say, what we need to see us through this great ordeal are to exercise the, the, the uh, virtues of, of patience and fortitude. And these were the names that were acquired and uh, kind of applied to these two lions that stand guard. So it's so interesting, isn't it? The lions which stand guard at libraries at museums at uh, St. Jerome, I guess. Uh, we always see him pictured with a lion at the foot, I, I believe say, uh, they are these guardians of wisdom. So I thought that was a really wonderful image to have for a book that was kind of continuing this exploration, not of the collector this time, but of the librarian, people who preserve books. And, and so it went. A Splendor of Letters dealt with particularly the, the, the various writing surfaces that we've had through history. You, you mentioned my book, uh, uh, on paper. Well, that just looked at one medium paper, which has been the principal one for 1500 years or so. But books have come to us in any number of different different forms and formats as artifacts, you know, as 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 uh, clay tablets, as uh, papyrus scrolls you know, on, on, on marble, on wood. The Romans used wooden tablets before they could, uh, had, had explosion of papyrus scrolls. And so I thought, you know, for the one that we have used, which has been central to our lives, and as now as we trans transform over to the digital medium, a, culture, a cultural history of paper would be in order. And so it was just really, a, a, I mean, my background is in journalism and in books, but it's always been as an investigative journalist, which I have a, a, a background in, uh, of one thing leading to another. I mean, when you're following a paper trail, you know, or you're doing an investigation or you're doing scholarship in a library. And I do try to apply very, very rigorous scholarly disciplines to my work. I mean, I like to think that I'm a writer of narrative nonfiction. I like to tell a story. 
I mean, Duke Ellington said it ain't, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we really talk about storytelling to me is essential. Narrative is essential. But that said, I don't I don't use anything in any of my books unless I can document it thoroughly. And as really tempting as seductive as something might be, a detail that you find in the internet, and you might find it repeated three thousand times, but nobody gives you an original source. You know, if I can't nail it down, if I can't use it, uh, if I can't cite precisely where it came from, I don't use it. So I guess using all these these disciplines and these skills have just led me from one study to the next, which did. Now you might say, well, okay, how does that explain? How does that? How do how do you get from paper and bibliomania and bibliophilia and biblioclasm? Do you know what biblioclasm is? You must know. Biblioclasm. I'm just. Forgive me, I go off the track. You know. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> but in one of the books, I, I, I discussed, you know, the deliberate destruction of books through history. So that it has never been enough if you, if you have a mind to destroy a culture, to destroy people. It's never enough to merely kill them. You have to destroy their books. You have to destroy their heritage. And the way to do that, of course, and I had a, a chapter in one of my books called Ex Libris Punicis, uh, the Carthaginian libraries, when Rome decided to destroy Carthage, it was not enough to kill all the people, salt the soil and burn the buildings, they destroyed their culture. And yet some few books were saved. Now, that's a whole other story. But I remember running across reading Sallust and the, and the uh, low classics, and they were discussing the destruction of Carthage on one side and looking at the the Latin over in the left and seeing Ex Libris Punicis. I said, my God, the Carthaginian books. There was the title of that chapter. So there was Biblioclasm, which was one of the, the stat, one of the uh, interests in one of the books. Inevitably, it comes to writing surfaces, paper. So how does that get us to Longfellow? Very interesting. Uh, it's my first biography, and it just seemed the, the next step. You know, I, I felt it felt to me like I've written about all these uh, aspects of book culture that I just mentioned. And now let's now let's write about somebody who actually was a book person who was shaped so much by what he studied, by what he read, who was a powerhouse in the 19th century, who had kind of fallen out of who had not kind of he had fallen out of fashion, not through any any fault of his own. I mean, there was a development in the early 20th century. I mean, the advent of modernism and new criticism. And these 19th century poets, these uh, white Anglo-Saxon poets, if you will, or whatever, uh, all of a sudden were no longer deemed fashionable. And Longfellow wrote these beautiful poems that people that were that we'll, we'll read a few in the course of the uh, of the session here. But uh, beautiful poems that people not only enjoyed but they understood, you know, and which resonated with them. And uh, all of a sudden, it was perhaps not fashionable to, to admire poetry that was so easily uh, comprehended. I don't know the various reasons, uh, but for some reason, and a, perhaps a multitude of reasons, reasons, he was he was ejected from the literary canon through much of the 20th century. And you know, I was a young man in school many years ago. So many of us memorized, were committed to memory, so many poems by Longfellow. And uh, you think of Paul Revere's ride and uh, listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. We all, we all memorize that. And when I wrote this book, I heard from so many people of a certain age and they say, oh, I memorized, I knew, I memorized the Psalm of Life. I loved, or I memorized uh, the Cross of Snow or one, or various lines of Hiawatha or Evangeline. You know, people just loved his poetry. And then for some reason, he was no longer being included in the literary canon. And, you know, what is the canon? You cannot be canonical, cannot, canonical, I guess, if you're not in the anthologies. You know, it is really the anthologists who determine what the canon is. If you're no longer being included in the anthologies, then you're not going to be read. And if you're not read, then you fall out of fashion. And I just thought that was so manifestly unfair for a person who really was uh, unparalleled in terms of his celebrity and his fame. Not only, not only in the United States, but really all over the world. His works were translated into 30 languages, at least in England, in Great Britain, in the UK. When he visited in 1868, uh, it was kind of a victory tour and he met with uh, Queen Victoria in Windsor Castle. He met with Dickens. He went and spent the day with Lord Tennyson on the Isle of Wight, who took him to visit with uh, 
Julia M Margaret Cameron, who took that wonderful photograph of him, which we use on the dust jacket of the book. That's so I love that picture because that really that shows Longfellow at the very height of his fame and his celebrity. When he when he traveled to to Europe in 1868, it was he still would live for another 14 years or so till 1882, but but he was at the absolute apex of his fame. And when Queen Victoria received him at Windsor Castle, she remarked, she looked, she noticed that the household staff, the domestic staff were taking up various vantage points. They were hiding behind curtains to get a view of this man with the long beard that was visiting her. And she wondered, how do they know who this poet is? How did they know him at all? And later that night, she later that morning, he was there in the morning, she inquired amongst the staff. They all knew who he was. They all, they all loved his poetry. And she wrote in her journal that night, how remarkable, and it's in the book, how remarkable that a poet has this power, not only for those of us who read regularly, I guess there's whatever her class assumption might have been, but his fame spread across all social strata, all all demographics, and it really dazzled her that he had such fame. And you know what, when he was there, when he was visiting at that time, and he visited with Tennyson, and they became very good friends, he was outselling Tennyson in his own turf. He was outselling Robert Browning. This is how popular Longfellow was in the UK and the British Isles. And when he died in 1882, he was then and remains today, the only American, the only American to have a bust of his likeness placed in Poets' Corner at Westminster Abbey. This, so his fame was enormous. People ticked, quote lines from his poetry today. They have no idea they're quoting Longfellow. You know, ships that pass in the night, footprints on the sands of time, the patter of little feet, voices soft and sweet. I mean, you can go on. Multi, you're quoting Longfellow, you know what I mean? And and even though you might think he was, he was, uh, 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 excised or cast out of the canon, he really wasn't because he has this kind of a power. Well, I thought that, you know what, I'm kind of local. I live about 45 minutes from Boston and Cambridge. And so I had the resources of Harvard University and Houghton Library nearby. And also what I really had also was the Longfellow House, which is a National Park Service historical site and is really, in my view, unique among houses of writers, certainly in the United States, for American writers. And not only is it the home of a former writer, but it is maintained as a national historic site. And all of the contents are original or are, are authentic. And I don't mean just the books, but I mean all the furnishings, the artworks, the cutlery, the, uh, the house is exactly the way it was in Longfellow's time. And so when you visit there, it's, it's really like, it's like entering a time capsule. And, 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 and not only is it this museum, but it is also a research center. They have something in the neighborhood by their count of 800,000 archival materials. So, and so many of them, you know, so much of that material has really gone unexamined, unaccessed. And it seemed to me, you know, he had his bicentennial in 2007. And on that occasion, I wrote an article, an appreciative article for a Smithsonian Magazine, which was Longfellow on the occasion of his 200th birthday. And so I did have a chance to then to really immerse myself in the holdings there. And I also discovered while I was there, there's a great, there's a great story here. And it's to me again, going back, it's all about storytelling. It's a great story here that remains to be told, not only with this untapped material, but a story that had gone untold entirely. And it really, and it really kind of circles back to the title I chose for this book, Cross of Snow, was the love story this love story that has uh, Fanny Longfellow, the second wife, uh, up to now has always been out there on the margins. This brilliant woman that he pursued and uh, pursued in a courtship that took over seven years. He anguished, she rejected him over all these years. How they finally became a couple of courses at the heart uh, of, of the story, but also once they became a couple. And for 18 extraordinary, magnificent years, you had this, not only this loving relationship that produced five children, but uh, they lived in this glorious splendor in, uh, in this house, which formerly, by the way, it's a mansion, it's, low, it's on the banks of the Charles River. And, and it, it actually had a, a, a historical significance in that during the American Revolution, 
for nine months during the siege of Boston. It served as the command headquarters and official residence of George Washington. So it was, and so uh, the Longfellows had this historic sense. Was, they were really quite far ahead of their times on this, it's because when, when Fanny Longfellow, this wife, was the daughter of a very prosperous tech, textile manufacturer. That's another story. And as a wedding present, he purchased this house and gave it to them, and that's where they lived. But it was—I I have a chapter that I call Camelot on the Charles. I mean, it was a—it was—it was an idyllic marriage for 18 years, not only loving but also very creative. It was an intellectual partnership, and I think that's one of the, one of the most exciting things I was able to develop, as not only how once they became a couple, they were inseparable, and it's one of the reasons, by the way. We really don't have a body of love letters. I mean, they're, they're exact contemporaries, the Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning. You have these magnificent, wonderful uh, love letters, uh, courtship letters, as they call them. The original ones are here at Wellesley College. But there are only nine letters from Fanny Longfellow to Henry that you could actually call any letter at all. And maybe two or three of them you might describe as a love letter. The simple reason being is that for seven years, they really didn't communicate by letter. And then once they were married, Henry says to a, an admirer in Great Britain, who wonders if he will be coming to uh, Great Britain at any time soon. If he does, will he be bringing his wife? And Henry writes back and he says, it is our theory of life to never be separated. And really to all intents and purposes, that's the way it was. But it was, but as I said, and, and finding examples, they wrote beautiful letters. Henry wrote thousands of letters. I mean, they've been published in six volumes. But at the Harvard Library, I was also able to look at the incoming letters and Fanny's letters. Again, she was a very brilliant young woman, privately educated by, by brilliant tutors because we young women at that time really didn't have higher education. So if you came from a certain station and your parents had a mind to, you would be educated by private tutors. So, and she was exquisitely educated. Henry was fluent in 12 languages. Uh, and we can discuss that on his trips to his, his trips to uh, to the continent and to extended visits to learn languages. But she was also fluent in four or five or six languages. And when they met in Switzerland, we can get into this if you'd like. He he dazzled her with her. She was eighteen years old when they met. He was ten years older. Uh, he had had just had a uh, his first wife had died in a miscarriage, devastating him after following a miscarriage. And they met some time later, and she dazzled him with his with her brilliance. But they were, and he was he was uh, he was absolutely one of the one of the most uh, uh, accomplished scholars in German, Italian, Spanish, any number of languages at this time. This is in the 18, 1830s or 18, 18, whatever it is, 1829, 1835. Uh, and they're walking. They they have a, they, they meet and they spend a fortnight traveling. And, and, uh, and they decide to translate a ballad from the German into English. And the one that does the best translation is Fanny. And he's supposed to be the, the authority on the, on the German uh, for English readers. And he likes her translation. He prefers hers to his so much that he uses her translation in, a, in an anthology that he, later, uh, that he later publishes. So I guess that's a long, that's a long way of, of getting to your question, of answering your question of what really prompted me to kind of become interested in this and the fact that it was nearby, that it hadn't been done in a long time, that I felt, I felt an obligation. I loved, I, I've always enjoyed his poetry. He's a very good man. He's a very decent man. He really didn't deserve the fate that he had been dealt, which was, was this exorcism from the literary canon. And if I thought I could do something to help uh, contribute to a reevaluation and a, re a new appreciation, for him that I would do it. And I'm, I'm not alone by any means. I mean, there are other people. He is, he does have a new life in the academy. Scholars are now looking at him again. He's very, he's very uh, of great interest in the UK and Ireland, I hope, and throughout the British Isles. Uh, he's always been appreciated over there. He never fell out of favor uh, in, in, in the UK and, and the others and the uh, other nations over there. They've always been very admiring of uh, Longfellow's poetry as the Westminster Abbey uh, tribute, I think, makes very clear. That's a long answer, <laughs> Mark. I'm sorry. But, uh, no, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, that's wonderful to hear. I want to ask you next, just um, then, what is it particularly about Longfellow that you think um, 
keeps him such an important figure but what is it about his work that is still so pertinent to today and timeless i guess you know i think he's especially pertinent to these uncertain times he, he gave people hope and and he one of the one of the occasional criticisms leveled against him which i think is unfounded is that people wonder why he didn't speak out more against slavery and why wasn't he a, a, a much stronger abolitionist as his great friend Charles Sumner was you know and uh, and he was he wasn't he did believe in, ab in, in the abolition movement he was decidedly anti-slavery but he was also a poet who reached readers everywhere and he really he wrote poetry but he wrote in a very indirect manner he he wrote about the, the necessity for a union. He, uh, he actually wrote, he wrote a, a collection of poems called On Sla uh, Slavery, On Slavery. It was 1845, 1845, I believe, when he came back from England on one of on his, his second, third trip to Europe. And on this passage home, he wrote nine poems on slavery. And it, 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 pre it precedes its publication by 10 years, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it was considered uh, controversial enough that a Philadelphia publisher wouldn't include them in a collection of his of his works. But but Longfellow really did appeal to the to a great mass of people. He was a very comfortable uh, uh, poet. Uh, he was a very soothing poet, a very decent poet. And I and I, I find I find this uh, especially during the Civil War when he had a poem called "The Children's Hour." And there was a painting in the house. I have it in the book, the three daughters of his three daughters. And it's the patter of little feet. It's the three daughters coming down the stairs and, and jumping into Papa's lap. And on the Battle of Gettysburg in, the, in 1863, uh, found amongst the dead, this is the bloodiest, one of the bloodiest battles of the American Civil War. Found lying amongst the dead was a little tiny locket with a reproduction or carte de visite of that, of that image of the three little girls. And it was, a, it was clearly a, uh, a reference to that poem of domestic values and love and this feeling for home. And it was never determined whether or not it was worn into battle by uh, a, a Confederate soldier or a Union soldier, it was fine. And it, 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 because he was, he was beloved and respected by combatants on both sides, he did try to appeal, I think, to the, to, to the great population of readers. And he did that just splendidly and magnificently in a way that, that he was very quotable. And he wrote beautiful, beautiful poetry. So I think he had this universal appeal. And when you look at the demographics, it wasn't just the, ma uh, the masses that read him. I mean, he was admired by, uh, by the intelligentsia. I mean, the going into the 20th century, Theodore Roosevelt, who was very probably uh, certainly most prolific author present, wrote 45 books. He wrote great, a great defense of Longfellow. Please don't forget, please don't dismiss Longfellow, he was saying as the dismissal was going on. Robert Frost was a great admirer. Robert Frost's very first book of poetry, he used a title that was a tribute to, a, to Longfellow. So uh, he, he had his admirers uh, uh, across the spectrum. And I think that's part of his great appeal. And it, it continues to be of great appeal. You know, they really, he was never stamped out. We have this kind of play out edition of American classics, the Library of America. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's been around since the 1980s. And I have all of them in a shelf over there, over part of the book, I, uh, about 150 different volumes. And I did a little, uh, a little investigation. How does the Longfellow volume stand up? You know, they've got over 150. Uh, he's, well, he's quite, he's up there. He's in the top 20. His, his, his books, uh, and it was a, this is an edition that was published 20 years ago, a new edition, selected edition of his poetry. It it does respectably. I have got the figures here somewhere. It's doesn't not relevant exactly what the number is, but it sells in a very steady, appreciative pace. So he he has retained this power, and uh, and uh, people continue to love his work. Yeah, marvelous. And just to, just to finish up, what it, what particularly it, uh, attracted me was his his, his decency. You know, I've, I've been asked, uh, what's the biggest surprise that I encountered when I was writing this book? I, I don't think I was really surprised so much by what I learned because it almost kind of validated what I thought about him and his work. But really, did 
surprised me was just how genuinely decent he was. He never said an ill word about anyone, and anyone who ever met him uh, loved him. He, he was he, they, they 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 just were so admired. Uh, when he was having a conversation with you, you were the only person that mattered. He listened to what you had to say, and and uh, he was very loyal to his friends. And and as I said, it was and I just found all of this validated in his and the correspondence that he received and what people wrote about him. And then when his wife dies, tragically, the outpouring of grief that was extended on his behalf was just uh, was just I've never seen anything like it. I'm sorry, so I wanted to go ahead and ask a question. No, perfect. Thank you, Nick. And um, I want to just put it into Irish context then. So like Seamus Heaney in our country and um, Milos in mm. Poland too, he seems to strike this balance between being uniquely American, but also um, belongs to the world. As you said, he has that universal appeal. I'm kind of wondering what, what um, makes him so paradoxically American yet of benefit to everybody? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> part of his biography is the fact that <clears throat> he was almost a, he was a polymath. He was brilliant. He graduated from college at, he was 18 years old when he graduated from college and he graduated very high in his class. He was number four at Bowdoin College, which is a very fine college up in Maine. I went to college myself up in Maine. Uh, he, one of his classmates was Nathaniel Hawthorne. And uh, on, upon graduation, literally almost on graduation day, he was, he was uh, the Board of Overseers at Bowdoin College voted to establish a professorship of modern European languages. And, and this young student, Henry Longfellow was 18. It's turned, it happened also that his father was a member of the board. So legacy undoubtedly had something to do with it, but he was brilliant. And he had, he had really impressed the faculty with his grasp of Latin and Greek and orations. And so they offered him this position. Imagine being 18 years old and you're being offered a position as, as a full professor of modern European languages. The only problem is you have to learn them. <laughs> there's nobody, and, and there's only three other colleges in America right now that are teaching them: Harvard, William and Mary, and the University of Virginia. So part of the part of the deal was, okay, you can have this position, but you have to go to Europe and learn the languages you will be expected to teach. And for, so for three, just imagine this: he's 18 years old. This is 1825. Graduates from college in 1825, and he leaves the following year. And his parents, he has such, his parents have such faith in him. He has such a, he has such a model of purpose and probity, as I say, that they entrust him, their son. I mean, this is, he goes on a, on a sailing trip, you know, across the Atlantic, and he's there for three and a half years. And I, in my chapter, I call it awakening. And he arrives at 18 years old, and he starts in France, and he, and he goes to uh, Spain, and from Spain, he goes to Italy, and he lingers. I mean, he, he goes to Spain, and he, he meets a young woman, and this, this involves a lot of investigative research on, on my part. I mean, you really don't, you've never heard that much about the young women that he, let's say, that he falls in love with while during this, 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 uh, this trip when he's a young man, which he embarks upon when he's 19, 18, 19. But these women are his teachers. Uh, uh, the young woman in Spain, he, he, she becomes his instructor in Spanish. And of course, he's only supposed to spend a couple of months there because the person who picked him, uh, who s suggested the, uh, the itinerary, says you really have to go to Germany. You have to go in the, the you've got to learn these, these German. That's, that's the language you need. But before he gets there, he's, he's only supposed to spend a month or so in Spain. He spends, spends six months in Spain. He hates to leave Spain, but his father says you have to correspondence. His father who was underwriting this trip. He goes from Spain to Italy, he spends a year in Italy. I mean, this is twice as long as he's ever supposed to spend there. He falls in love with another young woman there who's also who becomes his, his instructor, uh, his, his, his tutor in, 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 uh, in Italian. And along the way, I think he picks up half a dozen languages and he calls himself and when he, he returns, he writes a memoir. Ultramare, and it fashions it on Washington Irving's travels. And he sees himself, this is even before we, we have the word, the name multiculturalist, you know, but he, he sees himself as a cosmopolite, cosmopolite, as a traveler in the, in the fashion of, uh, 
of uh, Oliver Goldsmith and, and uh, Washington Irving and uh, Ben Byron, and these are his heroes. And he quotes, you know, from all of these all of these traveling writers. And and he and everywhere he goes, he 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 wears the he wears the costumes of the limp. And his father hears about it. He writes his, an older brother how he dresses up in these French clothes and he walks on the boulevards. And of course, the brother wastes no time telling the father who's underwriting this trip. And he says, you should, you will do best to wear your American costumes. And we know that Henry dressed up because he does these wonderful sketches of himself, which are in the book. I hope you've looked at them. Yeah. And he has a sketch of himself as Henri in France. And he has another sketch of himself as Enrique in, a, in Spain with Spanish. And then he's Enrico as the Italian, dressed up as an Italian. And when he gets to Germany, he starts, he, he wears the these fashions, but he's, He's not just learning the language. This is so critical. He met Washington Irving in Spain. Washington Irving was there working on his biography of Columbus. And Washington Irving impresses upon him, this is so key, that it is not enough for you just to learn these languages, but you must also learn and absorb the literatures. So when he comes back to the United States after three and a half years abroad, and he takes up his position finally at Bowdoin College. He's 22 years old and he's a full professor. And there's a wonderful painting of him in robes, his academic robes. And he's also the, the college librarian as a collateral duty. So he influences the books that come in and, and he's kind of transforming the collections from a more ecclesiastical tone, which is the way libraries were. It becomes more humanistic. Uh, he, he, he admits uh, books of, in different languages. And then six or seven years later, from out of the blue, he gets an offer to be to become professor of languages at Harvard, Harvard College, which is, of course, you know, the ultimate appointment. And again, the same terms apply. Uh, we want you to come. We want you to be the head of our department. But now you have to go back and master the German that you were supposed to master the first time around. And he does this, and now he's got a young wife that he's met up in Maine, and he brings her with him. Uh, tragically, she we don't know when she conceives, or we don't really know how far along she was, but the young woman has a miscarriage while they're in Holland, and she passes away. But meanwhile, while he's there, he has these great values of work, and he continues with the job of the task at hand, and he learns another half a dozen languages. And he brings all of these cultures, he returns to the United States and now for the next 18 years, he teaches at Harvard. And he, he is introducing, he is credited with introducing uh, Goethe and Schiller and any number of German writers to American readers. He will become in time, the first American to do an entire translation of Dante uh, into, into English by an American. Uh, his, he, he, he is very, really given very little attention and credit by people who don't know that much about him, know only of him as the poet, but he was a great linguist. And he really did believe in, in, in absorbing languages. He says that, he, he, believe, he says, writes a letter to, uh, to two of his sisters. He said, the more language a man or a person knows, the more people they become. And he, he doesn't use the phrase multiculturalism because that doesn't come along for several generations or whatever. But he, he really did kind of uh, epitomize those values of, of absorbing and different languages, different cultures. And I think that he, he, projected, he projected this to the readership. And I think it helps explain the appeal that he had all over the world. Uh, the fact that it's not just one very provincial kind of a literary discipline that he's developing, but he's, he is mindfully attempting to absorb and, and I think you see the various patterns and the linguistic patterns, but also the traditions that he's, that he's read in these, uh, in these uh, various cultures and introducing them not only to readers in the United States, but all over the world. I think that's got a great deal to do with it. Yeah, wonderful. And um, then what is it about his more formal ele elements that uh, you find most beautiful? So I think he's a beautiful uh, formal poet, like, Heaney, who you mentioned, and Frost, who you mentioned, and people like that, they're real masters of form. What are some of the elements that you find most um, intriguing? I just think that what you just mentioned, he is a master of form. He's a student. He's a brilliant man. I mean, uh, he he studied, he learned. Uh, when you, you he, for instance, when he, when he did uh, Evangeline, he decided to use hexameters 
you know, which everybody said, you, know, you don't do this. That's the Iliad, that's the Odyssey. Uh, this isn't appropriate to do uh, in English. And he decided it was the right, it was the right meter. I mean, he was gonna do it against all uh, uh, advice to the contrary, he did it. The, it was extraordinarily successful. But he, he thought the form really was correct for this particular poem, which is a heroine, by the way. It's an American epic, but it's a woman, you know, who's, a, who's in search of uh, her husband who was uh, pulled away from her in the British expulsion of the Acadians, you know, during the French and Indian War. Uh, and uh, he'd heard this story from Hawthorne of all people at a dinner and in his home. And he said to his friend, what are you working on? He said, oh, nothing, nothing's interesting. And there was a, there was a minister there where there was, what are you, what are you talking about? I, I gave you a good, good idea a couple months ago. He said, it's not in my vein. And there he said, hmm, tell me about it. Maybe it's in my vein. And he has this story, apocryphal or not, or possibly true, about this couple that was separated on their wedding day by the British. And they took her husband and they sent him away. And, and she spent the rest of her life trying to find him and thus, you know, becomes arguably the most successful poem and, uh, that he ever did. He was very gracious. He thanked Hawthorne and Hawthorne was very gracious to him. He said, I don't, he said, what you did in poetry, I don't quit. It was a very gracious uh, note that I quote in the book, but, but it was a form that he used. Uh, he, in the sonnet form, which we know is very structured, it's 14 lines. Uh, he turns to the sonnet towards the end of his life. He's done and it, when he does his translation of Dante, he introduces each of the three parts with two original sonnets of his own, which are beautiful sonnets. Uh, Harold Bloom, I mean, the great Harold Bloom, who I interviewed for this book, told me that uh, in his view, uh, and I, I subscribe, I mean, who, who, who's to dispute Harold Bloom, that he believes that Longfellow uh, is the master of the sonnet for an American, uh, amongst American poets. He doesn't think there's a, a, an American who writes a better, a better sonnet than Longfellow. And I, and I really challenge anyone to, to prove me wrong because I do In fact, the Library of America did put out a book, a little collection of Amer American sonnets. And so there's a good selection in there. And it's true. I mean, his sonnets are absolutely magnificent. One of the great ones of which of course is the Cross of Snow, which, uh, for which, I, which gave me the title of my book which he wrote, you know, in uh, 1879 or so, towards the end of, on the 18th anniversary of the death of Fanny, who we, which we haven't talked about here in this conversation. And, but she dies a, a horrific death without having to get into it here, but quite unexpected. I mean, uh, uh, a perfectly idyllic life is turned upside down by, by a domestic catastrophe. And after having lost his first life, quite tragically as well, he is totally devastated, but he's now a single father, and uh, and his his uh, work on original composition uh, eludes him for a while, and now he returns to a translation of Dante. So the great the great uh, artistic expression for him in the aftermath of this loss will now be the, to complete this translation of Dante, uh, and it's now he's been working on it off and on for twenty years. And, and you know, people see uh, echoes of Beatrice and uh, Fanny and his and his handling of Beatrice and the handling of uh, of fire and light, and especially as it all comes together in this, uh, for me, in this sonnet that he wrote on the 18th anniversary of her death, precisely, and they had been married 18 years precisely when she had had this, when she had had this uh, accident, and uh, it's he writes the self show. If I may, may I hold yeah, something up? because we don't have any slides here, but uh, when, I, when I was working at the Harvard Library, you know, you've worked with, you've worked with archives before. They're all very, very precisely ordered and you don't mess around with them. You mess around with your peril. So you turn a one page over, you turn one page over. And then I turn this over and I find, you know, in Henry's, look, that's the, that's on my thumb, the frontispiece, but that's the holographic copy of the, of the sonnet which he called the cross of snow, which he wrote uh, apparently in a single night and he dated it at the bottom, July 10th, 1879. And then he folded it and he put it in an envelope and put it away because it was too personal. So it was discovered after his death. And, and I remember looking at that and saying to myself, oh, this, this in 14 lines of poetry, 
it kind of gives me a, an architectural blueprint really of the book that I want to write because it really does kind of structure the way I wanted to write this book of this. I really wanted to have these two, these two converging characters speaking in their own voices because they both wrote so many letters, wonderful, beautiful, beautifully written letters, very eloquent, uh, brilliant. And also they both kept journals. I mean, so really it was a, I was able to have them really speak authentically in their own voices and kind of working as they come together as a couple and in their years uh, as a couple. But this poem that he, that he wrote, in fact, why don't I read it to you? Would you like to hear it? Please, thank you, Nick. Okay, let's find it over here. I have so many things put aside, but what it is, is it's a, uh, it's a contemplation. As you know, a sonnet is 14 lines, you have eight lines and octave the six lines and you have two different ideas. So in the, front, in the first eight lines, he is discussing a painting that only he sees at night. It's in the bedroom of his home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Massachusetts. And it's on the opposite side of his bed and he looks at it every night beautiful painting and it's a fanny. And then when he gets to the second half, he discusses uh, this final six lines. He discusses a painting that was uh, called the mountain of the Holy cross, which Thomas Moran, it was a mountain that had recently been discovered in the West and the Rocky mountains. So these are the years of the, you know, Western expansion. And it's a mountain that was, there had been photographs taken of it. And then there was Thomas Moran did it famous painting, which was shown at the Philadelphia Exposition of 1876, which Henry traveled to and visited, and he'd seen it also reproduced in magazine. It was quite extraordinary. There, was these crev there were these crevices on the side of the mountain, it still exists, and it's in the shape of a cross. So it gave him two images, the one of his wife uh, in the bedroom and seen only generally by himself, and then this painting enjoyed by millions of people at the Great Oak. So here it is. In the long sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face, the face of one long dead looks at me from the wall where round its head the night lamp casts a halo of pale light. Here in this room she died and soul more white never through martyrdom of fire was led to its repose. Nor can in books be read the legend of a life more benedite. There is a mountain in the distant west that, sun defying in its deep ravines, displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wear upon my breast these 18 years, through all the changing scenes and seasons, changeless since the day she died. You talk about an image of contrition across the size of a mountain that he wears across his been on his chest for 18 years. And the, and the use of the word, people say, oh, Benedite. Why does he use the word Benedite? Because it, it's a perfectly appropriate word. I mean, it's blessed. It comes from Benedictus. It's St. Benedict. It's, uh, it never was a soul more Benedite. So it's a perfectly appropriate word, which he actually uses several times also in his translation of Dante. It's, it's a magnificent poem and, and it's a sonnet. And it was too personal. And he really did kind of normally avoid writing about very personal things in his poetry. This time he did, and he folded it and it was discovered after his death and it kind of comes to us. And I said, there's, there's my title, you know, Cross of Snow for this book. But that's a perfect Petrarchan sonnet, perfect in every respect in its composition. But he wrote ballads, he wrote odes. He, he even tried his hand at, uh, at uh, dramatic verse. He, he really worked with every different kind of, of form, of poetic form, really uh, uh, observing the conventions, the meters, the techniques, the structure. And I've talked to any number of university scholars who have just, who just study him just for, the, just for his handling of, of uh, and I'm, I'm not an authority on poetic structure, but I can certainly appreciate it. And I certainly know uh, people who, who know about it better than I, it's just are, they have such great admiration for it for his skill at, at, at uh, writing in various forms, which he, which he learned from European sources. That's another one of the raps against him, you know, is that, well, well, maybe he relied too heavily on European forms of structure in his poetry. Uh, why didn't he, why wasn't he more inventive like Whitman or 
the Dickinson. And you, know, you can have these, you can have these arguments. And I'm not saying he's the greatest American poet of the 19th century, but he certainly deserves to be in the conversation. And he certainly deserves to be read and, and, to, and to be uh, preserved. So anyway. Amen to that. There's my 25 cents worth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I 100% agree. And thankfully your work is doing a service to us all so we can get a fair um, shout, I guess. <laughs> so um, in the book, you also show that Longfellow's renown was so wide reaching that he developed these deep friendships with people from Charles Dickens to Hawthorne, you mentioned to Emerson. A Julia Ward Howe and Charles Sumner you mentioned before. So I want to ask you about that. And um, what are some of the more interesting stories and anecdotes from the book in your view and um, things that help us to describe these relationships with other well-known fi figures of the time? Yeah, there's a, I, have, I have a chapter in the book that I call Mutual Admiration Society. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and of course, the, the relationship with his wife is central. I mean, that's the central relationship in the book, but his male and also also his friendships and relationships with women, you know, are, he, he is a great champion of women. I mean, this is a this is a subtext in the book and it begins with by with with there are letters from between himself and his mother when he's a young man, when he's a 15, 16 year old college student in Brunswick, Maine, and he's being charged with watching over an older brother who's kind of, you know, not nearly as responsible as Henry and their students together. So he's been being required to report on his brother's deportment. But in the same letters, he's having these literary discussions with his mother on, the, on Thomas Gray's elegy in a churchyard, you know, and, uh, and, and she is re reading his comments and she's responding in, 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 in a very questioning kind of Socratic way. And you see this throughout his life. He has these very respectful uh, relationships, intellectual relationships with women, beginning with his mother, beginning and continuing with these two young women, the, uh, the Spanish woman, Florencia Gonzalez, and the, uh, the Italian woman, Giulia uh, Persiani in, in Italy, very respectful relationships. And he does say, I, I read his, his, his lectures, so he, a number of his lectures are preserved at Harvard, and I read, I read the, uh, the, uh, the documents there, his, the, the holographic copies of his lectures. And in one instance, he's talking about Dante, and he said, never once, never once will you ever see in Dante a single denigration of women. And not just, not, and not just his relationship with Beatrice, but you will never find Dante denigrating women. And I say in the book, you can say the same thing about Longfellow. He applied, he applied that to himself. You would never, I don't know if you recall that one, that one, uh, we, this was new in the book. Well, he had this relationship with this woman in Spain. And another, another fellow who had introduced him to this family, Mackenzie, he had had a relationship with her. And, and of course, she was exquisitely beautiful by his own account, by Mackenzie's account, who wrote a book and included her in the book. And then he was a naval officer and he had to go back to the US and resume his duties. And he was actually working with Washington Irving. So this is how these circles work. But this is why the value of not only the letters that Longfellow wrote, but the long letters that he received, which Harvard has thousands of them, thank goodness. And there are these letters from Mackenzie and he's goading him. He keeps asking him, tell me about Florencia. Tell me, isn't she the most beautiful woman you've ever met? Henry writes back these wonderful letters. They're very respectful, but he never once, never once rises to the bait. He will not discuss a word about his relationships. And you say, this is an 18, 19 year old kid, you know, showing this kind of a respect. Well, this is with the women, but, but also his friendships with, with his male friendships are really quite remarkable. I mean, his, his friendship with Charles Sumner, the great abolitionist Senator, who becomes the great abolitionist Senator uh, is, is, I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary uh, exchange of correspondence and, and exchange of ideas and sympathies. And Sumner, like Fanny also, his wife, reads his poetry and, and comments on it. And when Henry married, Sumner is devastated when Henry, Mar I mean, he loves Longfellow in whatever sense. I mean, I think it's a, you know, an intellectual sense, a French lip sense, but regardless, He's devastated because he feels he's losing his friend, but he also becomes to love Fanny. And so be they really become kind of a threesome at the 
at the dinner table. Some is a constant visitor to the house and they're talking about poetry. And uh, when Henry marries Fanny for a wedding present, a New Year's present, I beg your pardon. This took a little triangulation on my part to figure out what the present was because all I found was a note in the Longfellow house to Sumner thanking Sumner for your remarkable gift. She doesn't say what the gift is. So what the heck is this gift? She says, the greatest gift I've ever received. And she says, coming from you especially, I know how precious it was to you, which makes it all the more precious to me. Okay, what is it? So then I go to Harvard and I'm looking through the Harvard stuff and I find something at the same time. Again, in one of these archives where I'm seeing the, and in the file for the holographic manuscript for the Psalm of Life. And there's a letter from Sumner to Fanny because it's in a different file. And he is giving her the holographic manuscript for the Psalm of Life, which Henry had given to him as a gesture. And this, of course, is the great poem that that's kind of the breakthrough poem of 1839 that, that really uh, leapfrogs him, that really makes him this international force. It's, it's picked up and it's read all over the world. Psalm of Life, of course. Uh, you saw that poem that the Chinese emperor had, had inscribed in Mandarin Chinese on a fan, on a wooden fan uh, with the paper handmade panels and since gives to Longfellow as a gift. Uh, you know, this is with all these uh, famous quotable lines. Uh, and this is the poem that Longfellow gave to Sumner in which Sumner in turn, as precious as it was to him, he gives it to Fanny Longfellow as a, as a present. But uh, his friendships, are, uh, you know, he has another friendship with George Washington Green, a fellow he met as a young man. They were both uh, traveling through Europe. They were 18 this, this last throughout their lives. And it's wonderful. They're a, and Green gets a position as an envoy in Italy. So he's away. So they write, there's a, there are over 500 letters just from Green from Longfellow to Green and from Green back to Longfellow, hundreds to Sumner. To, so really in these friendships, you can see, you know, this, this they, they come to call themselves the Mutual Admiration Society. That's their name for themselves. They're also called the Five of Clubs. It's very, they're very clubby and then a, a, very, a very tight circle. And, and, uh, and, and it's just very in, in Longfellow's nature to be very loyal to his friends. You will never find an ill word, as I said earlier, you will not find him expressing an ill word about any of his friends. And uh, even uh, the, only, the only time you can find anybody really attacking him is Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, who for his own, who never knew him personally, but has his own reasons, uh, whatever they are, for not liking Longfellow. And he really excoriates him in any number of different uh, reviews and articles. And what drive must must what must drive Poe crazy is that Longfellow never responds. <laughs> you know, other people do. Uh, there's a there's a, an essay written by signed by Outis, which is so I I I have a clue. I think I know who Outis is, but it's a defense of Longfellow against the charges of plagiarism by Poe, which were crazy, but they were very vicious and and uh, spiteful. So after Poe dies. Longfellow, by the way, gets is contacted by Poe's mother-in-law. She's destitute, and he gives her money. This is, I mean, even after Eddie Poe has just been horrible to him, Longfellow gives sends money to this to this relative of, of the woman he's never even met her. But he's, he's speaking with another poet by the name of William Weaver. He said, he said to Weaver, he "said You're a young man. You're just starting out in your career." He said, but let me tell you, so let me give you a bit, of, a bit of advice, which is, he said, people will say bad things about you. They will attack you. He said, ignore them. My advice to you is say nothing. Just keep it an even keel. And it must have driven Poe crazy that Longfellow would never, re how tempting as it must have been, he never did. You can't even find a bad word about him in his journal. And his journal he kept for 50 years. So I, I, I guess... Um, I think, as I said earlier, one of the big surprises for me was to was to discover just how thoroughly decent he was, and that it really did, it really went throughout his life, and you see it in his letters and particularly in his relationships with his friends, because he's he he will remain ever loyal to these friends, and regardless of the problems that they're having, uh, another classmate of of uh, Longfellow at Hawthorne's at Bowdoin College, actually a year ahead of him, was Franklin Pierce. The, who was a president of the United States, arguably, you know, 
well, arguably uh, for a while, considered one of the worst presidents of the United States, without getting into that. But uh, uh, he had a lot of enemies. He developed a lot of enemies, especially up in New England. And Hawthorne remained very loyal to Pierce. Hawthorne and, and Pierce were particularly friendly, but you would never find Longfellow saying a bad word. But when it, when it was fashionable for others to turn against him, let's put it that way, you would never find it. He would just, he was just, a, you could absolutely count on him. And he would really very, he very rarely opened up about himself. People would say to him, Longfellow, you never say much about yourself. He said, well, you're right, maybe I don't. And this was at a dinner with Annie Fields, Annie Adams Fields. And somebody said, well, Longfellow, what's you said? He said, no, I didn't. I never said anything about it. Cut him right off in mid-sentence. He said, no, no, I don't. And he actually wrote a, wrote a little item once in, one, in his journal. He said, if one could be confident that your life would not be exposed to the world, uh, then I'd, I'd be more forthcoming in my journal. And if his journal does have uh, lapses, I, I, I think it's the fact that he could have been more forthcoming about deeper things. And he could also have been a little more forth, forthcoming about his creative process because it drives you crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, because he's such a professional, he will say one day, oh, I started Menza Boho today. What the heck is Menza Boho? Well, it turns out then he changes the name to Hiawatha. You know, he changes the name. This is, it's got, he likes the sound of it better and it's a name that works. It's based on scholarship, but then that's all he tells you. Then two or three weeks later, he's doing this. And the next thing you know, the poem's done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are some poems that he tells you a little bit more about. The Courtship of Miles Standish, you wouldn't even know he's working on it based on his journal until the day it's, until all I'm working on this. Or Fanny Longfellow says, well, we, she was going over proofs with him while we're working on Miles Standish. But, but other than that, he was a very professional and uh, I wished he would be a little bit more forthcoming about himself in those journals. But other than that, he was intensely loyal and he established these friendships and people really coveted having coming to dinner at his house. I mean, they, they entertain and there wasn't a very, usually six or seven or eight people. So it was always, you know, very cozy, very intimate. And, you know, you mentioned Oscar Wilde. Well, Wilde was the last one to visit him, I guess, before he died for a breakfast. And Wilde really lobbied lobbied furious, uh, furiously, but very intensively to wrangle a, uh, an invite that he could go and have, uh, have meet with Longfellow and Longfellow, who was not well, but re very graciously welcomed him into the house. Another thing about him is that he, because, I, because he was so fluent in many languages, and people would say this about him, I forget exactly who says it, but it's in the book, they said, well, he speaks French with Frenchmen. He speaks Italian with Italians. He speaks Spanish with Spaniards. Uh, any, uh, Dom Pedro, the emperor of Brazil, comes to his house. And of course, they speak Portuguese together. Uh, Ole Bull, the, the, the Norwegian, the great violinist, they speak Norwegian. Uh, uh, Frederica Brema, the Swedish writer, they call her the British, the Swedish Jane Austen. They, they speak Swedish, you know, and it, it goes on and on and on. I mean, and his, his language skills are perfect with all of these people. And it's quite remarkable, you know, that he is able to cross these lines. And he not only does he know their languages, but he knows their cultures and he's tried to absorb them uh, into his life. And his wife uh, was also very cosmopolitan along these lines, too. So it was a, a very uh, uh, symbiotic relationship uh, in that respect. Yeah, wonderful. I'd love to ask you a bit more about Fanny, actually. So the book you do describe the pursuit, um, the fiery crucible of Fanny and um, his emergence as a literary force from letters. Can you tell us a bit more then about Longfellow as a devoted lover and how he maintained hope throughout the difficult circumstances that he faced and maybe how some of these virtues are expressed in his poetry? Well, if you mean talking specifically about the relationship with 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 his wife yeah he, he he again with one of his friends he confesses to george washington green and uh, so there uh, when i said that he doesn't often open up about himself well he does in a couple of occasions there are a couple of letters which in fact the estate for many years wouldn't allow to be published and i quote the relevant ones you know, at great length in the book <clears throat> but he confesses to green that Pardon me, while he was traveling and he was in Germany after the death of the first wife, 
who he was very happily, blissfully married to. She was a lovely young woman by all accounts. And I give Mary, the first wife is Mary, I give her a chapter uh, based on everything that I was able to find about her because it's rather fragmentary. She died at 23. She was a young woman from Portland, Maine. And he met her when he came back from the first trip and they married and they had a four year, very happy marriage. They had no, that was, in fact, this miscarriage would have been their, their first child. Uh, and he was devastated, truly, truly devastated. And it was beyond grief. I almost think it was a, a tinge of guilt uh, he felt because uh, she was very happy up in Brunswick, Maine as the wife of a young professor. And, uh, but she also was very supportive of his aspirations and his career. And so when the Harvard job was offered, she agreed to come, you know, she, and she was a, a fragile young woman. She was very fearful about going. She didn't want to go. And she agreed to go if two of her best friends came along with them while he was studying. And lo and behold, she, it's a very arduous trip and she has a miscarriage and she dies and he, he's devastated. And that is evident in his, in his, in his journals. So not only does he feel, uh, as I say, grief, I, I believe there's a, when he writes about her in a poem and uh, um, uh, footsteps of angels and he writes, uh, she comes, she visits him in the night and she lays her gentle hand in his and, and she says with soft rebukes, now, what, what is she rebuking him for? You know, you don't know, but I, I, so, and he thought, and I think he thought almost, I don't know, but he thought maybe this is happiness and it's gone and I'm, you know, I've, I've lost my happiness. And then out of like a thunderclap, he meets this young woman in Switzerland and this is Fanny Appleton, who's traveling on making a grand tour with her parents. I mean, as you talk about serendipity meeting at Interlock and then Switzerland and how they happen to cross paths. Henry is just, just, he's anguishing over the loss of this first wife. And he finally says, I can't learn anymore. He's there in the depths of a winter and he goes off on a tour of the Rhineland and he, he wants to go into Italy, but there's a problem with his papers. So he takes a left and he goes to Switzerland and there he runs into this traveling group from Boston and he impresses them as he always did. He was very impressive, handsome, uh, instantly likable. I mean, everyone liked him instantly. He's one of the, we've all met people who are, you like them on the spot and he made, he made friends. It's, it's impossible, I say in one instance of the book, to find anyone other than Poe to say a bad word about him. And Poe never met him, but everybody acknowledges he's a thoroughly, genuinely decent person who's instantly likable. And so I think he makes a good impression on Nathan Appleton, Fanny's father, who's this very wealthy Massachusetts industrialist, who for their own reasons, dealing with grief of their own, the loss of his wife uh, through consumption, the loss of a brother for consumption, and the traveling with a consumptive cousin who will die shortly after Henry meets them. And Henry is very nice to them. So they travel together. And, uh, and he should, not only is he dazzled by her, and I, I, if you, that chapter where I introduce her to you, I wanted you to meet her fully grown, you know, like, like Athena from the mind of Zeus. When you meet her, I want you to meet the young woman that Henry meets. And then we, then we backtrack and we discuss her education and her background. But when you meet her on the, on the deck of that sailing ship about to go to Europe in the middle of November after the, the death of her brother and her, her father decides on a, on a whim, I'm gonna take my daughters to Europe because there's too much grief and we're gonna go, I'm gonna spend some time with my daughters. But you meet her sketching what she sees, becoming friends with the captain who teaches her celestial navigation. She's just, she's just a font of energy and enthusiasm to learn. And she dazzles everyone that she meets. And when she meets Longfellow, I mean, the attraction, I'm sure, is this, he, he, he has a very great, strong attachment. He loves women, but as I've said, uh, and he, he feels that he has to have a life's companion. And he feels also that he's lost that with his first wife. And then all of a sudden he meets this young woman, he's dazzled, they have a nice time. He goes back, he starts teaching at Harvard. They come back to Boston on Beacon Hill and he starts uh, wooing her. And uh, it takes a while <laughs> without getting into it here. Uh, and then finally, when she does, which we discuss in the book, and I think I can explain why she changes her mind. Uh, but when she does agree to 
marry him, he writes into his journal, oh, and he does this every year at the same date, the date that she has accepted his proposal of marriage is, oh, day forever blessed that ushered in this vita nuova of happiness, the new life. He never thought he would have this new life of happiness again. And now not only is it a new life of happiness, it's a blessing. It really is a, it's a blessing to him because he really felt that he had lost it. He was young and he, and just like when he's, he'd gone actually to Europe for a water cure, he deeply depressed. I think he would probably say he had a nervous breakdown. And it was Dickens actually, who, who, had, who he had met during the 1842 <clears throat> trip to the United States. They became very good friends, he and Dickens. And they exchanged nice, lively. And Dickens said, when you come to Europe, you're gonna stay with me. There's no two ways about it. So he went to he got a leave from Harvard. He went to tea, he went to get the water cure. And then he went and he spent some time with Dickens. And I think that's just delightful. And, all, and he's very manic at this point. He's having a great time. He's having a wonderful time with Dickens. And then he returns home and he's invited to a party and Fanny all of a sudden encourages him to come by. And it's, and everything's wonderful. While he was on that first trip, he writes a, a, another poem, another sonnet, which also remained unpublished in his lifetime. It's called Mezzo Common, halfway from the first line of, of Dante, halfway through life's journey. And he basically said, I'm halfway, he was about 35 at the time, whatever he was, halfway or 20, whatever he was, halfway through life's journey, he feels his life is a failure. And meanwhile, he's published books, he's published poetry, he's been a university professor at Harvard and Bowdoin, he's written, done translations. You know, by any measure, he's a, he's a success, but in his view, he's, he's a failure because he really, he really feels the need for a, a companion. And then all of a sudden she accepts, she accepts his proposal and it ushers in this vita nuova of happiness. And it really was a very blissful relationship. But she also recognizes, and she writes letters about this. She's very uh, perspicacious too. She recognizes that as special as their relationship is, Henry's friendships with his male friends is equally as important. And she writes this to a friend of hers, Emmeline. And she says, well, Henry often gets jealous of me when I say there were only there were things that only two women can talk about as he also, as he gets, and then I have to remind him that he has a similar sort of rela relationship with his male friends. And they, 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 they do, they have these, they, uh, Samuel Ridley Howe is uh, another one, uh, uh, Samuel Ward, uh, Charles Sumner. These are friendships that last forever and they're very, they're very, they're very forthcoming and they're very supportive. I mean, it's, it's Longfellow that, that, uh, that introduces uh, Samuel Ridley Howe to Julia Ward Howe. Everyone thought that Julia and Henry would be a match because she was brilliant. She, she had a Fanny Appleton kind of mind. She was a brilliant young woman too and very attractive woman. But I think he'd, he'd had his mind set on uh, Fanny Appleton and that was that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, these, these, these friendships uh, are, are very, very central to his life. But I also think that he thought that he had lost the opportunity to have a, a very lasting uh, relationship with a, with a woman, and, yet, and that, and then he, and then he had that relationship, and then after she dies, he writes in his journal. Thus and thus ends life's second act. So the first act was the first. It's in dramatic terms. It would be, the first act was the with with the first wife Mary in his youth, and he says of Mary, who unto my life was given, to to, to love me, and unto my youth was given to love me, that was Mary. And then she died and he was still a young man. And then of course, Fanny comprises the next 18 remarkable years. Their 18 years of marriage is also very, very significant that not only was it loving and nurturing, but it, it, it also represents 18 uninterrupted years of productivity. There's nothing like it in his career. It's just, this is when all the great long narrative poems are written, you know, the building of the ship, Paul Revere's ride, the uh, uh, Hiawatha, uh, Evangeline, Miles Standish, one after the other. He's he's working, and she's working with him, and uh, and it's, so it's, uh, it's he's very happy, he's content, and he's very productive. And uh, it, pardon me, it was a it was a remarkable remarkable situation.
I don't know if that's responsive to your question. No, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, and you really do bring home those very humane elements in his life and work, uh, which I think are exceptionally important. And um, well, in line with that, I want to ask you next about what do you hope then, having put in all this um, time and effort for Henry's legacy? I think um, myself even, it's vital to refocus on those human elements um, which reveal you reveal in this great poet and um, ensure that he's remembered, especially at a time when we see, I think, in literature and history, that uh, there's a, maybe because of certain like, critical theories and things like that, we seem to focus in inordinately, I think, on persons like sex or their ethnicity. That's one part of it, I think. And then what C- C.S. Lewis talks about um, chronological snobbery is if everything like technological progress must progress, um, say literature, music, ours must be better than the past, but I don't think there's good reason to um, assume that. Uh, would, would you like to speak for that a bit and the importance of his legacy? I think his legacy, uh, you'd think it would be secure. I mean, anyone who is uh, this, you know, popularity is not necessarily a measure of greatness. So I, I hate to say it because he was the most celebrated by far poet of the 19th century, certainly for an American, that the, therefore he was great. You know, but he was the most celebrated poet of the American of the 19th century. And but he is great. Is he the greatest? Is he Walt Whitman? No. Is he Emily Dickinson? You know, uh, Daniel Aaron, a wonderful critic. He died a few years ago at 103 and he was a Harvard scholar and he said, you know, American literature is not all that rich and varied that we can afford to to uh, to discard a, a, a writer as good as Longfellow. <laughs> you know, they, I, I'd like to think this room, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's does it have to be one or the other? Does it have to be? I, I, I love Walt Whitman and I love Emily Dickinson, so therefore I can't like Longfellow. I mean, isn't there room? There has to be room. And uh, he was, he, he came along at a very specific time. We talk about, you know, Hiawatha, the, the Indian epic. You know, that wasn't the first time an American poet had tried to write a, a saga about the Native Americans. There were, Dan, Aaron pointed out there were 18 or 19 previous po- poems along those lines. I mean, you know, Hamlet was also, there was a Hamlet before Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. I mean, not long lost, but, you know, I mean, you take things and you deal with them and you you apply your own genius to it and uh, and, and you give it to the world. And, and Longfellow really resonated with so many different people. He was very important to their lives. And uh, I, I think that that uh, that stands for something that that he should be. And what is the literary canon that he should be he should be arbitrarily uh, rejected because all of a sudden he didn't fit the norm of of uh, the new frontier in terms of versification and composition. And he wrote things that people could could understand and comprehend. Uh, <clears throat> Jill Lepore wrote an interesting article once, and she was trying to deal with this the same uh, issue of you know legacy and and she 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 quoted a letter that Longfellow received hundreds and hundreds of letters from children and there was one letter from an eight or nine year old girl from Ohio and she said dear Professor Longfellow I just want to write I'm paraphrasing of course but how much I love your poetry and I've been and, and I read everything that you've written and and I've even committed them to memory and blah 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 and so Lepore says, well, you know, for, for modernists uh, t- to be in- read and enjoyed and understood by children is the sweet sloppy kiss of death. Those are her <laughs> words, not mine. You know, and that, that I think if Longfellow knew that he was loved and read by children, he would be thrilled, you know, because he was this very inclusive poet. And if, and if you're loved and admired by children, so much the better. I mean, does it have to be inaccessible? And, and uh, um, you know, but just, uh, any number of his poems are, uh, they aren't necessarily that, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to use the word superficial. I don't want to use superficial at all. But I mean, you think of a poem called this, <clears throat> The Snowflakes, you know, 1863. I mean, I just, this is three stanzas. I'm just thinking because we had 18 inches of snow here the other day, you know, I said, grab this poem. 
But out of the bosom of the air, out of, out of the cloud folds of her garments shaken, over the woodlands brown and bare, over the harvest fields forsaken, silent and snuff, soft and slow, descends the snow. Even as our cloudy fancies take suddenly shape in some divine expression, even as the troubled heart doth make in the white countenance confession, the troubled sky reveals the grief it feels. This is the poem of the air, slowly and silent, syllables recorded. This is the secret of despair, long in its cloudy bosom hoarded, now whispered and revealed to wooden field. Beautiful poem, 1863. People say he didn't write much after the death of Fanny. He did, he wrote shorter poems and I think more, more contemplative ones. And, uh, uh, and there are a lot of gems there to, to be discovered. And that, that anthology published, uh, the collection rather, it's not an anthology, the collection published by the Library of America. A uh, very fine selection of his work, and and well, there's a good reason why it remains a seller. You know, is because people are rediscovering him in many ways. I love the story of Robert Frost. You know, in the in the 20th century, he was giving a lecture at Bryn Mawr College, a women's very prominent women's college outside of Philadelphia, <clears throat> and he said, "I think I'll, I'd like to read to you today. You know, three a few poems from a, a poet I've just discovered." And he reads, I think that was one of them. He reads to them three poems. And each one, the, the, the audience is enraptured. And then he said, who's the poet? Who's the poet? And he said, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And they, you know, gasps and groans. We're not supposed to like him. He's not supposed to be good. We're not supposed to be, be impressed by these poems. That's a true story. I tell that in the book. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big welcoming world. I mean, I don't think it's as... It's fair for somebody this good and this decent to be uh, to be not known and to, to, to not be read. And, and if I've contributed in some very small way to perpetuating it, well, then, then you know, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. Demo job. Thank you, uh, Nick. I think you have. And um, I think you show that it's not mere sentimentalism or anything, that through that heartache, he still maintained hope. And there is a hard edge to him. It's not... Um, so. Oh, it, it would have been so easy for him. I mean, he's he he was he was hit by tragedy not once, not just twice. They lost a daughter, which is devastating. You know, a little girl, her mother's namesake. And when you read Fanny's uh, uh, diary, and then you read his diary, I mean, it's the loss of a child. And uh, and his faith is personal, by the way. It's it's never shaken. You know. You, would, you could have understood, well, um, why me? Why me? You know, I mean, uh, but he, he never goes down that, that, that route. I mean, there's hope. The very last poem that he writes, The Bells of Sun Blast, and the very last line, I mean, it's the, uh, I have it here. I mean, it's uh, a day, daylight, daybreak everywhere. The final line, it's this, the sails into sight, it is daybreak everywhere. He doesn't, and he dies two or three days later. I mean, it's it's he it's not he doesn't it's not shrouded in darkness. It's bathed in sunlight, and I think that's kind of a, a metaphor for for Longfellow. He is a poet of the night in one respect. So many of the the and there's a long sleepless watches of the night. I mean, it's the night. I think he's uh, he couldn't sleep, and then when he's writing about the first wife, it's in the night. She's uh, night footsteps of angels visiting him in the night. Uh, but then he also finds uh, uh, beams and of, of, of bright sunlight, and you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's 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 good. I mean, I'm I'm really pleased I spent the years that I did with him. It was wonderful to step into that house, which is a uh, you know, I mean, you, you can say, well, you go, you do, you step back because everything's authentic. And all these people that I mentioned, they all visited there. And then back in George Washington's time, I mean, Benjamin Franklin was there. Uh, any number of different, the councils of war met there. The Dante Club met there in, this, in his office. You know, it's a, it was a, a very iconic place. And you kind of feel, you know, the, the spirits of these people kind of coming out of the woodwork. And, uh, and to handle these authentic documents, I'm sure you felt the same. You know, people say working with original documents, the the actual manuscripts is, a, you know, quite, quite a thing. It's an electric thing that you get from a piece of paper, which yeah. kind of feeds into the whole, I guess, 
concept of the kinds of stuff I've, I've liked to write about. Yeah, we'll come to that in a, a sec too. Actually, uh, just, just before we move on to your book about paper on paper, actually, um, what are, then are some of your favorite poems by Longfellow? And is there any that you would like to recite now? Or Well, I think I've done most of them. Done them already? That's kind of... <laughs> Not most of them, but I've done a couple of them. I mean, I'm, uh, The Cross of Snow, of course, is, is for multiple reasons, you know, matters to me. I love the snowflakes. I love the bells of sunblast. Uh, the ones that you don't normally think of, you know, oh, the seaside, but the one we, we got. Well, there's one I really like. I've got to, I, I, well, you know, the, the poem, I mean, the building of the ship, which is about the building of a ship. I mean, it's an occupational poem. This is what people did. You take an occupation if you're a blacksmith or you're a farmer or this and that. And he grew up in a seafaring community in Port, Ports, Portland, um, Maine. And uh, he had this friend, Slidell McKenzie, who we write about, and it's pretty obvious that he got the factual information from a, an item McKenzie wrote for an encyclopedia. I document how that, the, the likelihood of that. But he writes this poem, and uh, there's a British architectural, um, uh, he's the head of the shipbuilding in England. He actually wrote that it's the best poem that's ever been written and likely to be written on the actual making and sailing of a of a, of, a, of a wooden, you know, of a seagoing vessel. That aside, he's writing this poem, and this is his friend Sumner comes to visit him, going back to Sumner. It's during, and they're, they are supporters of what's known then as the Free Soil Party. And this is a very abolitionist party, and Sumner is the voice of that. Longfellow is very supportive of it. It's the day before there's a primary election in Massachusetts. And they are supporting this free soil. And Sumner comes by to visit Longfellow at his house. And Sumner writes about it in his journal. Henry writes about it in his journal. But Henry has already written this poem and submitted it to his publisher. It's already in proof. And he, we don't know the conversation that they have, but they're really concerned about the union. They're concerned about this, this horrible, this curse of slavery. And he just he writes an, a new a new couple of lines and he writes them on the spot. And we know it because it's dated and he writes it on the proof sheets and he sends it to, to James T. Fields, his publisher, the next day. He says, I hope it's not too late to make this change in the poem. And the, the change is these lines. All right. Tell me if you don't, they don't ring. Thou too sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union, strong and great. Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years is hanging breathless on thy fate. Union, he names the ship Union. We're worried about the breakup of the Union and the Union. And, and so, okay, this poem just took off. But then, you know, you say, well, does poetry have, have a resonance after its time or beyond and even during its time? 1863, at the, at the, this is 1847, this poem is written. During the depths of the, the Civil War, it's recorded. This poem is read to Abraham Lincoln in the White House. It reduces him, reduces him to tears. And it's just, and he said, what, what, what a great gift for a poet to be able to write this. Jump ahead to 1939, 1940. You know, Britain is standing alone against uh, Germany, Nazi Germany. And Churchill and Roosevelt haven't even met yet. But and Roosevelt is very supportive, but one night he, Roosevelt writes out from memory on a piece of paper that very verse and he sends it to Churchill. Churchill reads it before the House of the, the Parliament. He reads it on the BBC. I've just received. You can find it online. Do a Google search for it. You can hear Churchill actually saying it. I have just received from President Roosevelt, you know, this and he reads it. Shale on, oh ship of state. Magnificent. And <laughs> so you're talking about a poem having the power. You know, England is standing alone. And here's one poem with one verse that just has this power to, to go forward. And when you talk about Paul Revere's ride, you know, listen, my children, he's supposed to be writing about the American Revolution, right? Paul Revere, he reigns out through the village, he gets on his horse and he goes out to the villages and he talks and spreads the word the British are coming, they're on the march. But the poem, you know, that's published. It's actually published in the Atlantic Magazine in December of 1860. 
and it's, and it's, it's, it appears in print. It's a January 1861 issue of the Atlantic Monthly. So it appears basically, and it's being printed on the very same day that South Carolina is seceding from the Union. And you know, you think of all he's talking about, he's talking about the American Revolution, but you go to the very final line, very final three lines of the poem, with everything over here, I do it from, uh, I do it from memory, but I'd probably mess it up. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, he talks about, he's talking about the Union. Well, I don't have it at hand. Maybe I have it. I've got too many papers here. No, that's Hiawatha. Take, take, take my word for it. The <laughs> Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. I don't have it at hand. Forgive me. I'm sorry, Mark. I've got too many papers here. But again, it's a statement. It's a statement. That, oh, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. So it's just the final six lines of the poem. Four, born on the night wind of born on the night wind of the past. And of course, that poem has got the clippity clop sound. You talk about using different meters and different lines. You know, that whole poem, uh, Hiawatha's got like a tom tom drums going, but a tom tom verse. But now you go through Paul Revere's ride, it's the sound, it's almost replicating the sound of hoofbeats. So he says, for born in the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will wake, the people will waken. So he switches from past tense to future tense, doesn't he? The, and this is on the eve of secession and the war is coming, the civil war is coming. People say Longfellow is not writing about current events. Please, he is writing about current events. The people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. Pow, you know, most memorized poem of an, 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 an most memorized, memorized American poem. I think that's, uh, no one will dispute that. There's something there, you know. When he writes, when he does Hiawatha, it's, I say, well, it's about Native Americans, but how does that start? That's, uh, this great spirit gig summons all the tribes. And he says, he tells them, he said, and of course he's good, we were in divisions. He said, your strength is in your unity. Your division, your division is, your, is, uh, is, is, uh, is what divides you. Here it is right here. This is from the prologue to Hiawatha. And this is the great spirit. I am weary of your quarrels, weary of your wars and bloodshed, weary of your prayers for vengeance, of your wranglings and dissensions. All your strength is in your union. All your danger is in discord. Therefore, be at peace henceforward and as brothers live together. You know, and, uh, this resonated with people. I've used that word too much here today, but uh, you know, I mean, poetry has it's these multiple layers, I guess. And, uh, and his poems were meant to be read aloud, very important. He's called the fireside poet people of the people, you know, the people's poet. Uh, another po another one I love since you got me going, I wasn't going to read it. But... <laughs> I love this because he never really dedicated his books uh, with, a, with one or two. He did the poem on slavery, did the Reverend Channing, but then he didn't even, didn't even dedicate a poem, a book to his wife, you know, he just didn't do it, except the seaside and the fireside <clears throat> of 1850. And I had a rather lengthy poem. I won't read the whole thing, but it kind of reminds me of, of Prospero's final oration, you know, on the epilogue of the Tempest. And it's, but it's to the readers. It's to the, to, to, he, he dedicated that book to his, because he's not, he's internationally renowned. This is 1850. So he says, as one who walking in the twilight gloom hears round about him, his voices as it darkens and seeing not the forms from which they come pauses from time to time and turns and hearkens. So walking here in twilight, oh, my friends, my friends, I hear your voices softened by the distance and pause and turn to listen as each sends his words of friendship, comfort, and assistance. If any thought of mine or sung or told has ever given delight or consolation, he have repaid me back a thousandfold by every friendly sign and salutation. Then he goes on, thanks for the sympathies that you have shown. Thanks for each kindly word, each silent token that teaches me in seeming most alone, friends are around us, though no word be spoken. And it goes on. 
magnificent. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you got to have passion for this. I think, I, uh, you know, if you have that, it sustains you. You need something if you're just going to spend 10 years on a book, I suppose. But uh, um, he, he speaks to me in a way. And uh, through his poetry, through his example, a very, very strong example, a wonderful example mm. you know, decency. I guess as if I asked for one word, uh, it's, it's uh, that one. Thank you for that, Nick. About uh, Longfellow then, before we move on, actually then, um, I think what you re are revealing there and what your book has revealed and the impression that I get from reading Longfellow is that, um, as you say, there's no need to be a snob about it, but he hits on archetypal themes. I would read it in a Jungian sense that he is always going to be relevant because he taps into archetypes and then from a distinctly Christian perspective, there's an emphasis that I would put on typology, which is a whole <laughs> kind of complicated thing. That's a, kind of the theological equivalent mm -hmm. to Jung's a psychological theory, I think. But um, yeah, I think it, it makes sense that he will last through the ages. Just that's my <laughs> two cents. <laughs> well, you know, uh, who's to say? But anyway, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, on paper, then, the everything of its 2000 year history. So in those pages, you, um, ever the <laughs> bibliophile is a bibliophile, uh, you show that paper has been civilization's constant companion. What does that mean and why is it important? And um, especially, I think, as most of us really take it for granted. Well, it's, it's ubiquitous. And uh, you use paper every day and every imaginable, you know, I did, a, I did an op-ed piece for the Los Angeles Times shortly after that book came out, oh, seven or eight years ago, whatever it was. And it was the myth of the paperless society, you know, this idea that we're, we're entering into this all digital uh, reality. Uh, and there is no doubt, of course, that, you know, we get our news uh, online and the newspaper as we know it is a, probably a dying, and, but, but to say that books and the paper you know, uh, is, is disappearing. I, I don't want to be a Luddite and appear to be a Luddite, but, you, but paper is, is, is so essential. But, but, but the whole point of that book was that it was a cultural history. And the use of the word everything, by the way, it was in caps and italics. So it, it, nothing can be everything. Uh, it was not an encyclopedic examination, but it was a very selective cultural examination. And, and I thought that not just as the medium of transmission, which is, you know, what was was the reason why I went from, you know, books about the other aspects of bibliophilia that we discussed into the medium of transmission, the writing surface. So yes, yes, so paper for books and for information that comprises a, a core element of that book, uh, but also how paper is figured really in every other manner, in every, a remarkable manner of applications and how necessary it is. I mean, you talk about defining technologies, you know, I mean, that's got to be a steam has got to be a diet. You know, I, I was thinking about doing a book about steam too. You know, that would be quite an interesting book of really tapping and controlling steam became one of the great metaphors of the 19th century. And of course, that's, that's a, a, a gaseous thing. It's not a, a thing that you can feel, but it powers everything out of water. Uh, I mean, it's a, the gas, the vaporish state of well, that's a whole other story. But paper, you know, is a, is a as currency, as 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 notation. How how the the development of blueprints allowed the 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 introduction, the arrival of the of the industrial revolution. I mean, you could never have had the industrial revolution unless you could make blueprints that were precisely uh, uh, designed and machined uh, locomotive. Think of making a locomotive without bl a blueprint. Right? You job out all of these different things, our, our, our architectural plans, engineering plans. It was, uh, so that's just, that's just that element of paper. Uh, the paper cartridge, uh, how it just transformed all of warfare, you know, when it was introduced in, in Sweden in the 17th century. Before you used to do the musket with about 40 different steps to load your musket by, by by being able to make a paper cartridge, you reduce that to 26 steps. I mean, I, I forget the exact number there in that book, but uh, you know, it's just uh, how paper had just so totally become such a ubiquitous part of our lives. I thought uh, 
as, as, a, as a discussion as we entered into the 21st century when I first started that, it seemed an appropriate thing to, to consider and to write about. And it was a lot of fun, you know, and, and, uh, and I, I really went in areas that I never expected to go, origami, you know, who knew? Uh, uh, fabulous, fabulous consideration. I love doing that. Uh, what was the use of paper and espionage, you know, and uh, <laughs> the stories about how some of these great, some of the greatest uh, uh, feats of espionage really are all are all exercises in paperwork, you know, uh, identities and and uh, uh, articles and letters and uh, paper, paper, paper everywhere, and and and, and again using uh, it was all about storytelling. I mean, I, I would find these stories that I thought were appropriate and put them together. And then that I thought that epilogue that I had, you know, all of my books tend to start with an image of some sort. What's the image, you know, that I have that kind of drives that I want to work from. And that book, it started with an image, but actually I used the image to end the book. Uh, really gave me the thought, if you remember the destruction of the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers in 9-11, and I saw that happen from here and on the television as millions of others did. But what was spewing up into the air was just these streams, these geysers of paper, of paper. And the only artifacts of any significance that survived that Holocaust of a day were paper fragments. And then, so then I went and I just, I said, gee, I wonder if anybody archived these things and what kinds of things did they recover and what did that tell us about that? And I called it, you know, Elegy and Fragments. It was an elegy and it was kind of written, of course, 2001 is the first full year of the 21st century. So as a discussion of entering the 21st century, but then this paper story, so kind of, and then the discovery, the, I don't know if you read that book, but the final um, finding a note, that's it's in the book that had been dropped from the one of the 82nd or 84th floor of one of the towers just before it collapsed, picked up on the street by a woman who was fleeing and she read it and she gave it to a guard. So it's provenance is secure. It's, it's not apocryphal at all. It actually happened and it was preserved. And it said something like uh, 16 people trapped 82nd floor Northwest side. That's all it said. And it was folded and it was, and a futile attempt to get help, it was dropped out a window, picked up. And then as the guard looked at it, of course, the tower fell. But on that, I have the image in the book, but on that, on that piece of paper, there's a smudge and it looks like a fingerprint. It's blood and it's blood. I remember when I was, they were still putting together this 9-11 museum. And I was talking with a woman who was curating it and putting it together. I said, well, wait a minute, is that blood? Can you get DNA from that? Is there any, she said, well, we're working on it. So that was then. And then I went back three years or so later. That book also took seven or eight years to do. And I said, well, did anything ever come of this? And she was silent. She said, we got a hit. We, we determined who it was. And they had, she couldn't tell me the identity of the person yet because they hadn't even told the, this individual's wife yet. And then they did, and then the woman had a conversation with me. And so that's kind of the, you know, kind of a, the way that book ended. But it was just a, a, a way, that, I guess it was kind of a commentary, a meditation on a, on a um, technological advancement or an artifact, uh, uh, but how, how so relevant it had become in our lives in so many different ways, you know artistically i mean i thinking on paper when you think of people like thomas edison and i examined his workbooks or beethoven sketchbooks well so much of his life he was deaf but he, he wrote on paper or uh leonardo da vinci kept to uh, thousands of uh, he, these remarkable things that he worked out he couldn't do this if he didn't have paper his father was a notary and yet he and he carried notebooks with him everywhere so he thought things out on paper so I was just able to do, I guess, various considerations of paper in these kind of, uh, it was a nice book. I was, uh, got very good reviews and it was uh, interesting. You know, My editor, I remember she, I said, you, when she told me she liked it, she loved it. She says, why? She says, it's from, it's a baseball. She says, it's from left field. She says, it's just, you come at it from so many different uh, directions, you know? 
And uh, it was fun, the fun book. I, you know, thank you for asking me about it because it kind of led from there to Longfellow. Yeah, marvelous. I thought that's a story about September the 11th was particularly touching, remarkable to hear too. Um, I want to ask you next then, not to be insensitive <laughs> to that issue, but uh, just uh, as we move on, what are some of the seismic changes then that you expect with the move into this more digital uh, period? And um, I'm assuming there's going to be obviously benefits and losses. What do you think some of those might be? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm a... I know in one of my, you know, for me to for me to make a prediction, I put that in quotes. I know in one of my books, I thought, you know, I was talking about this transition to the digital book, and and yes, that's that's happening. <clears throat> I also did an interview with the the light then the librarian of Congress who said he thought that, and I agree with this, that this move to more digital media, you know, we don't need telephone books anymore. That's good. We don't need maps. I like paper. I happen to like map, paper maps, but we don't really need them. We don't need, we don't have to have paper dictionaries. So a lot of things that are information-based, data-based, especially scientific papers, you know, uh, monographs that are obsolete six months after they're published. Do you really have to pay a hundred dollars? And how, you know how much these monographs cost, right? They're published in a run of about 800 copies and are these, you know, and, and then six months later, it's, it's uh, so this sort of thing really does belong in a peer reviewed, structured uh, digital format that's kind of guaranteed that it will survive, you know, transmission. One thing you can say about paper is that you might think it's fragile, but it, you know, the Gutenberg Bible is over 500 years old. When paper is made well, it's, it's beautiful. And I've handled the uh, Gutenberg Bible, you know, and, uh, and it's the most, uh, you talk about a spiritual uh, moment, you know, I describe it in one of my books, this uh, late collector by the name of William Scheide happened to own a, one of the only Gutenberg Bible <clears throat> in private hands. And I was interviewing him for my first book, General Madness, and, and he, uh, he sat me down on a table and he went and he was an elderly man and he went and got this big box I didn't know what he was getting and he opened it up and then he was revealing to me, you know, his, his Gutenberg Bible. And I was taping this and, and all you hear on the tape, are you okay? He says, he's talking to me. I guess I said, and then you hear me, forgive me, sir, but I'm a bit lightheaded, you know? I mean, I'm, you, it isn't every day that someone invites you to touch where a metal type bit into paper for the very first time as he was now. So I was, uh, and, and if you're a bibliophile or a bibliomaniac, you know what this feeling is. And I imagine, I suspect a lot of your viewers feel that way because they work in, uh, they are scholars and they do work among uh, manuscripts and books. If I have to tell you what you feel when you pick up something like that, you can't explain it, but you know, you know it when you feel it. It's, 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 it's an amazing thing. I mean, it's not just the art, it's the typography, it's the paper. I just don't see anything like the binding, the, the workmanship and it, the, the, the Gutenberg Bible, what we call the Gutenberg Bible, the 42 line minds Bible is it's one of those great occasions in history where the first is the, arguably the best. Think about that technologically. How often can you say the very first is also the best? Mm -hmm. the, the book is flawless in every respect. I mean, there were no, hyphens, ending pages. I mean, the typography is magnificent. The paper was exquisite. Everything's done magnificent. Clearly, Gutenberg must have done a, did a few things beforehand before they came out with that production. <clears throat> but that book, you know, you say paper is fragile. Well, that was printed in the 1450s, you know, and it's and it stood up pretty good. When paper is done well, rag paper, when you don't have wood pulp, it can last for a long time. You know, what we've had all these problems with digital formats, you know, the old uh, cards, whatever you call them, remember the, the cards that went through computers and you go these huge disks down to the smaller disks and the smaller, and there's always this migration. You have to be constantly migrating, migrating from one, you know, interface to another. And, and, you, have to, and you have to have an interface. If you lose your electricity, you can't read, can you? For the first time ever, it's not just the ability to read, it's having a device that allows you to, you need a reader that has to give you an interface between you know, yourself and the text. 
you need, it's either electricity or it's a software or and if the software is uh, obsolete you know how many people if you don't have five and a half inch uh, can read five and a half inch discs on their computers i still have mine i mean not that i have need of it bigger but if you want to read some of these old things you need one of these old machines you know so I, I wonder, you know, have they resolved that? Uh, if you're talking about saving things indefinitely into the future, you have to have a medium that is secure. And I know the National Archives in the US and the UK, and I suspect in Ireland as well, you know, the archival copy is still gonna be a hard copy. I know I talked to the National Archivist, he's still the National Archivist, uh, David Ferriero for, for the paper book. Is when we have things that are really important, you know, even if they're generated, born digital, as they say, we still have a paper copy on good paper, you know, just to, you know, you have a paper copy. So that said, where are things going? You know, I know that the national, the Librarian of Congress said to me, he said he thought, and this is about 15 years or so, this was a, Billington, James Billington, very distinguished scholar. He said he felt that the arrival of the, uh, the digital book, the internet and whatever, the electronic book would allow the book to achieve its full potential as a creative medium, you know, and things like novels and works of poetry. And I believe that too. I know for myself, for me, reading a book is reading a book. Now that's not to say I haven't read any on electronic books and that I won't and that I'm averse to it, but I, I think that it does have a life. It does have a, it does have a future. Mm -hmm. um, and to make a prediction beyond 50 years or hundred years. And my, one of my books, uh, Splendor of Letters, I was gonna say, I, I said, well, and I, I told all of the, the, those little uh, things that I just mentioned, but I said, photography, I thought photography would never be, film would never be replaced. Not that I thought film was really because digital photography just wasn't, uh, but it is, you know, I mean, there's no more film. So I feel pretty stupid having said that in the book, but uh, not stupid, but I was wrong. <laughs> so I hesitate, to, I hesitate to make predictions because who's to say and who knows, things happen so quickly. Uh, but I, having said that, I believe I'm surrounded you can't tell from where I am, but I mean, there are books everywhere. There were books over there and there were books downstairs and there are books over there and there are, there are the houses of washing books. And uh, for me, I love them and I'm very comforted by them. Uh, do my daughters feel the same way? I think they do. Both, yeah. But, uh, you know, who's to say, who's to say uh, for myself, the books, books are essential. Yeah. Absolutely. That's as far, that's as far as I'm going to go Mark on that, because, you know, I, who's this, who, who, who can predict things ha happen so quickly, but you were really going to have to solve the problem of reliability and transmission the migration, I guess, is the word, mm -hmm. you know, and even when they have all this, uh, when they, when they transfer stuff from analog to, they still have to do refreshing, they have to refresh these, the, the, the copies and, and then as, as uh, media changes, you get if you go from discs to this and to this and to that and to that, you constantly have to do a new migration. I, I definitely can see things getting lost. Things have been lost. Our Viking probe, you know, going back to the 60s, was done on a kind of magnetic tape that nobody that's destroyed. All, all of that data that came back from space was lost in yeah. certain things, you know, because they they were too confident in, in, uh, in technology. And, uh, and that's happened multiple times in multiple ways. So I don't know, beware, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but... <laughs> I, um, I want to go back to a gentle madness then, if we may. What, sure. Can you tell us one or two stories from that book and um, what you found most interesting about some of those characters and some of the bibliophilia you, that you uh, brought to our attention there? You know, I'm uh, that book uh, observed its 25th birthday last year. Birthday. <laughs> yeah, it's 25 years that book came out. Uh, it was uh, came into the world, and I'm very proud of the title. I coined it, you know, and it's used. And it's not quite catch 22, you know, but it's uh, in terms of a, a title that's become <clears throat> idiomatic. But when people talk about gently mad or the gentle madness, 
<clears throat> of bibliomania, you know, it's nice to know that that's where the title came from. And uh, that was that book really did something that hasn't had been done before. And I don't think it's been done since is that there have been histories of book madness been written before. But that was the first that combined the historical record with the contemporary scene, and which is that that book took me a long time. And I really did travel everywhere, box the compass. I mean, I thanked in my acknowledgement as a travel agent, you know, arranged uh, things and everything had to be done uh, in person. I had to see the books, I had to handle the books, I had to interview the people and uh, traveled all, all over the United States, but, but many parts of Europe. And just to kind of get a sense of this passion to preserve and to, to possess books over 2,500 year period. So what are the favorite stories? <clears throat> I guess one of the things that really pleases me about it, and I, I started by saying 25 years, because in, in the 20, I went to the 26th year, in the 26 years that have elapsed, you know, 50 or 60 of these people that I profiled are gone, they're no longer with us. And how are their stories held up? That's the measure of, you know, the book was great when it came out, but uh, how does it look today? How do these stories shape up? And I have to say pretty good. The people that I identified as being the top of, of what they collected, you know, their collections now have gone to places like the Huntington Library, the British Library, the Library Company of Philadelphia, or, they, or conversely books that have gone to market and to go return to the market have set records for prices, individuals. So I, I'm confident that the people I identified as major bibliomaniacs really did belong in a historical overview. You know, they weren't just these, these ephemeral individuals who were impressive enough at the time. They were pretty good. They, they've stood the test of time and a number of them are now no longer with us. And so I, I did, oh, oh, I must've had three or 400 hours of tape recorded interviews, which are now all at the university at, at Texas A&M University in Texas. They acquired my research archive and they have digitized all of my taped interviews and they're available to anybody who wants to hear them. But so many of these people are gone and yet they're very important book people, not just collectors, but booksellers, prominent booksellers like the great Pierre Berez, a great dean of European booksellers. Uh, um, God, what's that wonderful bookseller over in Bar Barclays Square? I pulled a blank, but I'm just any uh, number of important book people and so they're not only do I tell their stories, but the interviews, which kind of are tantamount to being oral histories are available to anybody who wants to see them. So, uh, but I guess the, the story, the, the couple of this, you asked me of a story that stands out is the story of the, you know, the, the, uh, the story of the bookseller, who, or the book collector who went too far as the book thief, you know, the Stephen Blumberg, the chapter uh, 13, uh, this is the fellow who's, who, over a period of 20 years, stole something like $20 million worth of books, uh, and not f out of greed or to sell them, but because he loved them and to, to possess them. And when he was arrested, uh, I went to his trial. I'm the only, I was the only person from outside of the state of Iowa where he went on trial in the middle of a devastatingly cold winter. And I wound up interviewing with him and spending some time with him. And, uh, and that's this, and this, this guy, as I said, collected these things because he loved them and not because he necessarily needed the money to buy them. He, it was a, he happened to live like a homeless person, but he had a person that came of great wealth. And uh, so he, was, he was a pretty interesting, and he, he had very great taste, by the way, you know, I mean, his people's at his trial. And uh, his trial was very interesting because it kind of amounted to the charges were uh, criminal, what amounts to criminal bibliomania. Uh, he was charged for transporting stolen property across state lines, which is a federal offense, but the stolen property was the books. But his defense at trial, and this is unique, I believe, in the history of American jurisprudence, probably anywhere, his, his defense at trial was not guilty by reason of insanity. So when you have a book called The General Madness and your defense at trial, is, uh, I did it because I'm insane. You know, that's, uh, I mean, you, it's irresistible. When I saw that, I had to go and I covered that. And, uh, 
and it's a it's a fantastic story because I really did get to know him. It was it was also very interesting, very gratifying for me because when the, and then I wrote about that one in, in this. By the way, the essay. If anyone wants to read the full essay, <clears throat> go to my website uh, nicholasbazbanes.com. Under my essays, the very first one is the New York Times. I did a page one essay for the New York Times in 1991. So this goes back how many years is that? 30. Uh, 30 years when I first introduced him to the world and that essay. Um, and it's, you can read that whole essay. It's a, it's quite a, quite a situation, but having gone to that trial, getting to know him. Yeah. Well, I, what I wanted to say is, so when that essay got published and the book was published, I heard he was convicted by the way, and he went to prison. I got a letter from him from prison, thought the book was very fair, balanced. I got a letter from the judge, the federal judge who presided over the trial. We, we established a friendship. He thought it was very fair and balanced. I heard from the prosecutor and the defense attorney, they all thought the book was fair. And you know, it, when you hear from all sides that you got it right, you know, it makes you, if you feel like you've done something, you know, you've kind of done it right the way it's supposed to be. So, but that, I guess that story, uh, but there's so many stories in there. I think of the uh, the African American collector Charles Bloxon, who was uh, who's still alive and uh, and who was a great football player. We have the Super Bowl coming up here. You know, it was a big American football game, mm -hmm. and Charlie Bloxon played at Penn State, which is a big football school, and he was an All American and a great football player. And this is back in the 1950s. And coming out of college, he was offered and offered a full contract of a, a guaranteed contract by the New York Giants, the major football team, to play for football for the New York Giants, African American kid. And after a week of practice, he left. He walked away. And uh, I asked him, you know, Charles, why did you why did you give up? Why did you walk away? And he said, I was determined to become a black bibliophile. And he, he, he recalled the story. This was the 50s growing up as a young man in Milltown, Norris, Pennsylvania, Norristown, Pennsylvania. And he, remember, he remembers asking a teacher, this was in the 50s, why is it he asked her, every time I read a history book, I, I never see any mention of Negroes as the word was, or black people. And she said, and he didn't say it wasn't spiteful. It was just the thinking of that. She said, that Charles is because Negroes have no history, she said to him. She later acknowledged this, by the way, this is a true story. And he said, I didn't get, this is a big young man, you know, and we became, they called him the blockbuster when he played football. We're not talking about a, a puny little guy, great athlete. And he said, I didn't get mad. I just said, well, the, what, how does that square with all the stories I've heard about the Underground Railroad? My grandfather, my grandparents, is this not history? And he was determined, he was about 12 years old from that time forward that he would go to Salvation Army book sales, uh, uh, yard sales, and he would, any book that he saw that had the word Negro or African or black, there were several criteria, he would hide it and he'd wait for the days that they would get the books would be selling for, go on sale for two for 50 cents instead. Of, and he put together a collection. And when I found him, I came to, and I did find him because he hadn't been written about to that point. His collection of what, what was then 50,000 items had gone to Temple University in Philadelphia, making it overnight in an instant, one of the top three or four collections of Afro-American history in the United States. And he was determined, you know, and that he, he had gone to the New York Giants and he left instead, and he just concentrated on his collecting. And then his collecting, his collection ultimately went and, be, and became what is, this, what is essentially a research center. In Philadelphia, and then after he had done that, when I did a, a new edition, the introduction, a new edition of my book, I revisited Charles. He had put together another collection just like it, not quite as good, and that went to Penn State University, his alma mater. I said, Charles, I thought you'd give, I thought you quit. He said, Well, you know us collectors, Nick, we never give up. You can't stop. But, uh, and then he said to me, which was wonderful, uh, he said, Nick, how did you find me anyway? Because he hadn't been written about. I just through people, booksellers, you know, reporting, digging out stories. I said, oh, Charles, I knew you were out here. I just didn't know your name yet. Because I really, my point was, 
I didn't want to just write about wealthy book collectors, people, you know, who all they needed to get a Shakespeare folio was a five or six million dollars it took to buy it. You know, that's easy collecting if you've got the money. The, the great collecting is finding value where others only see worthless garbage. That's the great collector. The collector who sees is John Hill Britton, the great British uh, bibliophile, book hunter, as he called it, of the 19th century. He said the true collector is the, is the person who sees who sees value where others only see a pile of rubbish. You know, what's the treasure there? What deserves to be saved? And it's the person who saves these things and preserves these things. You know, it's not only having a good time, but but doing a service, you know, to, to posterity. So these these were the stories that I aim to tell. You know, I, the, the, the over the driving the premise of that book was not just this, this uh, uh, impulse to collect and preserve, uh, input, but, but what does the collection mean in the long run? Yeah. You know, and I wanted to do female collectors because they, it had been said for generations that women don't collect. Well, that's absurd, they do. Yeah. I proved that multiple times over. And then I wanted people of color and I wanted people of different, uh, uh, you know, means. Uh, well, collecting is one of the great things about it is you can collect with satisfaction at any level as Charles Blocks improved. And you can collect, you know, you can do a library that sells for $50 million too. You know, uh, it's another, it's, it's at the other extreme. And I wanted to have them all in there. And the book's held up, you know, it's, it's came out and people liked it and they still like it. It's still in print. Yeah. And that's a great, that's a great deal of satisfaction. Yeah, amazing. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about your own life then as a bibliophile and what are some of your very favorite books and your own collection? Oh, no. Well, my own collection for the most part, uh, along with my research, research archive, uh, which went to Texas A&M, uh, I gifted a lot of my books. So part of what went there, all of, well, we sent five or 10,000 I don't remember the number of an awful lot of books. Still have a great deal of a lot of books here. The books I collect these days, object, forgive me, my voice, uh, are basically things that support my research. I reach this, you know, I, one of the collectors I write about in General Madness, a fellow by the name of Toby Holtzman, who said, all, all collectors reach a point in their lives where they begin to collect, not by addition, not by addition, but by subtraction. You know, you have an obligation to the books. One of these obligations is, what are you gonna do with them? You know, I certainly wouldn't wanna saddle my wife with 20 tens of books, you know, it's not fair, <laughs> I don't know what you do with them, you know? But, uh, you know, it's, you, you start to think about, is there a good home for this? Or, and then my daughters come and I say, whatever you want, girls, uh, lady, young women, help yourselves, and they do that. And I've, and I have placed elements of things that I have in various collections. So there's that. But you know, I while I was actively collecting, I loved. <clears throat> I guess I love the books that I grew up with. I like collecting the books that I grew up with. And uh, I'm gonna, my wife's going to get me a fresh glass of water here. <laughs> Excuse me. So I had a wonderful collection of Hemingway. I had a wonderful collection of Faulkner, John Steinbeck, a collection of Tennessee Williams, which is now in Texas, was, I mean, it was one of the best you've ever seen. Not just because it was complete, but because of the condition, you know, condition is so important. They say in real estate, it's location, 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 and collecting its condition, condition, condition. And uh, the Tennessee Williams books that we had were, were quite magnificent. Uh, and it goes on and on. So, I mean, things that I read and enjoyed uh, um, as a young man coming of age in the, in the night, late 50s and early 60s, writers that mattered a great deal to me then were writers that I especially wanted to collect and which I did at a pretty good level of sophistication. And those are have now found uh, for the most part, a uh, happy new home elsewhere. And I'm, and I'm very uh, content with that, you know, I enjoyed them. And uh, it's important that, uh, you know, they go on uh, someplace else. Let me just turn this thing off. 
but go ahead, ask me another question. Uh, sure. So um, you follow this journey then with the surrender of letters and um, patience and fortitude and every book it's reader. I want to um, kind of ask about that because you've been called then the leading authority of books about books. I and like that. <laughs> it's nice. Thank you. I accept it. Why was it important yeah. to continue the journey with those for further two books? And um, t tell us more about the great libraries. and Well, uh, you know, it's like you, uh, if, if, if I can make a comparison, let's say, you, and especially being an independent scholar, I, I'm, I'm a writer, but I'm not affiliated with an institution. So I don't have a professorship anywhere. I don't teach. Uh, I might, you know, maybe I'll in my old age, I'll do some, but who knows? Uh, but the point is, let's say you develop a skill, you develop a specialty, you know, all of us, and I, you know, it's like going to medical school and, and you, you get your MD and you, all of a sudden, did you, do you, do you all of a sudden retire after you've, you know, done your first surgical procedure, you know, I, and having really developed uh, and done so much research in this area and, and really enjoyed it and and uh, developed an expertise in the field. I, and I had just seen that the, there was more to do. You know, I mean, the book of collecting wasn't enough just to write about collecting. Then I wanted to about, write about, you know, chronological history of libraries, the history of the world, you know, the Western world through its libraries. Then I wanted to write about the destruction of, uh, I wanted to, really cover this whole this whole world. So it was really, again, to go back to something I said when we started, it was one thing leads to another, yeah. you know, uh, what comes next. And then having carried that, I think, for me, to its larger, and also the willingness of publishers to, to give me contracts to write these <laughs> books, you know, that matters too. I have plenty of books I'd like to write, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you don't necessarily haven't excited the same you know, this comparable interest on a publisher. Not that, you know, that happens. Every writer has to find something that's 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 going to uh, that's going to impress an editor. And uh, and so I mean I, I've been very fortunate in that my ideas, for the most part, my proposals have have uh, you know met satisfaction and approval with with editors, and and they've willing to publish them and not only publish them but publish them very well because they're, they're beautiful books i have to say very nicely produced great dust jackets very nicely edited and laid out and you're very proud i'm very proud to see them out there you know that's another thing well that's a great sense of accomplishment so i guess it's just you know being not quite finished with the subject to yeah. answer your question yeah. and and having kind of done the books you know, the paper was kind of a transition book. The biography was a definite transition. So where do you go from there? Do I do another biography? I don't know. Um, I need a subject that, again, is someone, a publisher would be, would, would agree is worth, I have any number of, you know, thoughts on that. And I have not have not discussed it with any, my editor yet or my agent for that matter. This is a, difficult time you know the pandemic and uh, uh, the Longfellow book was kind of hampered by the fact that it came out in June of uh, 2020 in the middle of this world shutdown and every bookstore every bookstore in America was closed so they had to sell books when the bookstores are closed you know there was thankfully uh, thankfully internet sales and so it, it's had a life and it good, good reviews but in a perfect world, it would have been different. You know, I'm not complaining. That's just the way it is. So where do we go from here? Maybe another biography. One thing I would very much like to do <clears throat> is stay in the 19th century. Uh, that was such a treat. 19th century Boston. Now, so history in Ireland, where you are, and you know, and your neighbors. Well, history. You measure history there by centuries. You know, 500 years, 600 years. You know, but 19th century, 19th century Boston is a very interesting place, you know, the Beacon, Beacon Hill. I mean, one thing we didn't even discuss in this conversation today is, you know, the, the opportunity I had to profile Beacon Hill in Boston and, 
and 19th century Cambridge or Harvard, you know, and that was, and these circles, you know, these, uh, these various social strata um, that are in play. And, and I'm thinking very seriously about staying and definitely staying in the 19th century. And I hope sticking, doing something again in Boston, whether it's literary Boston or uh, some other aspect of Boston cultural life. I have some definite ideas about that. Some very exciting ones. I, I think it's probably a little too premature to discuss right now because it's still very speculative, but exciting. And sure. I, have, I have two ideas actually, which would draw uh, heavily on uh, research, wonderful, the wonderful research collections. And there were, there were, the research collections in Boston and Cambridge are without peer in the United States. I mean, we, that's another thing I write about in my, my book about uh, a general madness is that we really do have, you know, a dozen institutions with, uh, you know, Harvard is just the beginning and the Massachusetts Historical Society, 12 million manuscripts, uh, BPL goes back 200 years. The Massachusetts, I mean, it's just amazing. I once wrote an essay about 1200 years of collecting in Boston. That's what gave me the idea for general madness, in fact is that you know you had 350 at Harvard, you had 200 at the Boston Public Library, 200 at the Mass Historical, all collecting things and documenting history. And in every instance, this is what got, gave General Madness its premise. It was an essay that I wrote. In every instance, you find that, that the core collection starts with one, one uh, uh, driven individual, impassioned individual, you know, one afflicted with what uh, Isaiah Thomas, who a person who was a great collector and a patriot, who wrote the first reports of the battles of Lexington and Concord. He was a printer. And when he died, a grandson said the grandfather was afflicted from the earliest of ages. He was, he was a biblio, with the gentlest of infirmities, he was a bibliomaniac. And his collection became what's known as the American Antiquarian Society, which is here in central Massachusetts, where I am which is without peer as a collection of uh, uh, early American imprints, which was also helps me very prominent in my own research. Anyway, he was one of the people that, you know, gave me this idea for talking about the great collections through the people who are obsessed. And uh, similarly, we have great collections around Boston and with wonderful things and, and many, many original stories that like the Longfellow one, uh, have a lot of material to be discovered and to, and to kind of, you know, pull the story out of there. But we'll see. But 19th century Boston. Magnificent. I really look forward to it. Get back to me when, you know, we'll do this again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And your work so far has done a wonderful job, I think, at restoring our love for the, these great stories and repairing our sense of wonder and appreciation. Our historical imagination made us, well, hopefully more humble. And um, I want to thank you for your labors of love. And um, God well, bless you, Nick. <laughs> well, I've got to tell you, Mark, this is the most comprehensive interview I've had yet. <laughs> so that's a credit to you. Thank you. And thank you for, you know, being so really thoroughly prepared with wonderful, stimulating questions. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Sorry I lost my voice, but that happens when I'm having a good time. <laughs> no, thank you so much for your time.